Hi everyone. So this is a lesson that's going to go over viruses. We're going to introduce you to viruses in general. This is going to overlap a little bit with chapter 19.1 of your textbook, but we're going to emphasize more viruses in general and how they work and how it particularly pertains to COVID-19's virus, while your textbook in chapter 19.1 mainly focuses on two kinds of viruses, bacteriophage and HIV, which we're not gonna emphasize as much. All right, so to talk about viruses, we need to know what a pathogen is. So a pathogen is any disease-causing material or microbe, meaning small organism, such as a virus, bacteria, etc. cetera. Um, so not all microbes are pathogens. If it doesn't cause disease, it's not a pathogen. You have a lot of viruses and bacteria and yeast and protozoa that live inside your body that cause no issues in your body whatsoever. So we wouldn't classify those as pathogens, all right? A pathogen can come from any kingdom on earth. Animal and plants can be, par can be parasitic and live inside your body and cause issues. You can also have protozoa and fungi and bacteria that cause similar issues like that. Now, generally speaking, for living organisms that happen to be pathogens, the reason why they want to be inside your body is because your body is a tasty, warm, cozy, protected haven for it. It wants to utilize your tissues for a comfy home and a good food source. Now, this goes for harmless bacteria and yeast and protozoa too, except those things, when they coexist inside your body, they happen to be eating and taking in things that don't cause any issue for you. For something to be pathogenic, the method of which they obtain their nutrition has to cause damage or harm to the host, harm to you, all right? So for example, some bacteria in your body, they'll cause, they'll um, overgrow and start clogging up your pores that would cause acne, or they'll, they'll start overgrowing and then leak into your blood and flow into areas that you don't want, or they may release toxin that cause you to bleed or damage in your cells because that's gonna help release food for it, things like that. There's also non-living pathogens like viruses and prions. So when we talk about non-living pathogens, we have viruses, prions, and there's also something called haptins. Haptins are chemical pathogens. Uh, that would be like poison ivy or poison oak would be an example of a haptin. We're not gonna really go into that. We're really gonna talk about viruses today. So viruses and prions and haptins to an extent, these are not alive, so they can't reproduce on their own. What they do use is they take advantage of either machinery in your cells or things that are already present in your cells to spread. So in the case for viruses, what they do is they, successful viruses, are just DNA or RNA, genetic material, free, free floating with nothing else around it except a bubble, a protective protein bubble that for it to be a successful virus has happened to help that little DNA or RNA piece sneak into a cell. And for this virus to be successful, that DNA and RNA piece, when it sneaks into a cell, it has to have the information necessary for that cell to immediately use it. So essentially, it's a little piece of code that hijacks and takes over and makes the host cell the the cell it infects do its dark bidding. And for prions, prions are dangerous misfolded proteins that make other proteins into dangerous misfolded proteins. So in this case, they don't, so a prion can't make a new, uh, like duplicate itself and make another prion, but what it can do is find a healthy protein that's already existing inside your cell, touch it and transform it into an evil disease causing protein. So. But what makes it non-living, a non-living pathogen, is the fact that it needs the material that's already existing inside your cell to help it replicate. Now, when we talk about viruses, you're going to hear the term host quite a bit. Host is an organism that the virus is infecting. And when we say host cell, it's the cell of the organism the virus is getting inside. So, for example, a host cell in your body for COVID-19 might be some cells in your blood vessels, but would not be the cells inside your hair, okay? Now, all viruses, like I mentioned, just have to have that DNA and RNA material. And when I talked about that protein bubble that helps coat it, that would be officially called the capsid. So this capsid protects the DNA and RNA and assists it on its ability to infiltrate into the host. 
right? So our viruses want to, or viruses that infect us, want to hijack the proteins and organelles inside its cell to utilize the machinery to make more of itself, to make more viral genome, to make more viral proteins like the capsid protein and other things in order to assemble new virus babies that can then burst out of the cell and take over other nearby uninfected host cells. All right, now there are also some critical parts on some viruses and these ones are hyper relevant when we're talking about COVID-19. So one of them are envelopes. So envelopes are additional lipid membranes that surround the genome and the protein coat. And this envelope is just a typical lipid membrane. And it happens to help the virus fuse with the host cell a little bit more easily to sneak inside the host. Now that means that for the host cell, it needs to have on the outermost edge, a lipid membrane that is able to fuse with the lipid envelope. And that means envelopes are usually associated with, hu with animal animal viruses, viruses that in particular tar target animal cells. All right, you don't typically see enveloped viruses with plant-based viruses or um, fungus-based viruses because those viruses or those cells of plants and fungi have cell walls usually, which don't fuse very easily with an envelope's lipid layer. Now, in addition to that, on that lipid layer, it's sort of like a holding place for lots of spikes. And this is the key. The spike protein inside the envelope of these animal-based viruses and other viruses that are enveloped often are integral into its ability to sneak inside the host cell. So usually these spike proteins have happened to evolve into things your cell thinks it needs. So in the case for the um, virus for COVID-19, which real name is actually SARS-CoV-2, um, which is short for Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2, because the first SARS uh, was discovered 15 years ago. This is another version of SARS. But anyways, the spikes on it is used, or your cells think it's something called ACE2. And ACE2 is a really important regular regulatory protein in your body that plays a huge role in your ability to regulate your blood vessels and blood flow. So in the case for your body, a lot of cells that use your ACE2 receptors bind the SARS-CoV-2 virus thinking, oh, this is the chemical regulator I need to help regulate my blood. And instead what happens is when it takes it in, it, it swallows instead of the ACE2 thing, signal it's looking for, it swallows the virus and then lets the virus sneak inside of itself. So that spike protein really plays a role as a skeleton key for sneaking into certain cells in your body. Additional thing I wanna point out is because the spike protein is inside that envelope and because that envelope is just a lipid bilayer, that's a big reason why they, at least at the beginning, before we realize how much more important uh, breathing in the virus was over anything else for getting COVID-19. This is why they really emphasize the need to wash your hands really thoroughly with soap because soap is capable of disrupting and breaking down a lipid bilayer because soap is what we call amphoteric, which means it has nonpolar and polar parts. And that's actually helped to prevent and separate the nonpolar sides of the envelope in the virus. Um, from each other so that they break down. It's all kind of complicated. Uh, if you're really curious about it, this kind of discusses it a little bit more in detail, but we're not gonna get into it too much. You don't have to worry about it. Just understand the lipid envelope is what is actually targeted when you're washing your hands with soap. Okay, in addition to all that, you often times will also have some enzymes in addition to all that stuff we mentioned, in addition to the capsid and the RNA inside the capsid, or sorry, the genome inside the capsid and the envelope, you may also have some additional proteins there that help either stabilize, protect the RNA or DNA or whatever the genome is made of to get in, when it gets inside the cell, or it may assist with the ability for that genome to sneak in and take over really quickly, um, which it, it 
there are definitely proteins that are hugely involved in HIV, things like that. But when it comes to COVID-19, when we talk about it, we really end up discussing a lot of the time the spike protein and the envelope because those are the things we're usually trying to target when we're developing vaccines to catch and remove COVID-19's virus before it gets a hold of your cells. And like I mentioned, that ACE2 receptor plays a really huge role in determining where the um, virus will attack. So your ACE2 receptors, we know they line your nasal, th your nasal pathog passages and your throat. That's why a lot of COVID tests kind of swab the back of that <laughs> nasal throat region. Um, but in addition to that, it's also found and it's really present inside anywhere with lots of blood vessels. So your lung tissues, your kidney tissues, um, your skin. That's why sometimes people break out into rashes when they have COVID and things like that. This really accounts for the wide range of symptoms people have with COVID, especially if you're an individual that already has blood-related conditions. Diabetes is a blood-related condition um, or weakness that relates to weakness in your blood vessels like heart disease. Um, that, that's why those people are more prone to severe symptoms from COVID-19 versus someone who is much younger or, and doesn't have those illnesses. Okay, so let's go into the life cycle of a virus, how it initially infects, how it takes over the host cell, and how it makes its babies. By the way, you're also going to notice a lot of small text on my slides throughout this lecture. Just a heads up, that small text is extra information that I thought was interesting, but those aren't notes. The notes are the big text. All right, so the first step of the virus-like cycle is attachment. It's the virus recognizing the host cell and then tricking the host cell into thinking that virus is something the host cell wants. Generally speaking, it's when the outside of the virus's proteins attach and bind the receptor protein of the host cell. So just reminding you, receptor proteins are proteins on the host cell's membrane that help the host cell bind and recognize things that it may want to take in or may initiate a signal inside the host cell or whatever, causes a change in the host cell. In this case, the virus binds a receptor protein in the host cell that triggers the host cell to swallow the virus up, okay? Think of it sort of like the receptor protein is a lock on a door and then the outside protein of the virus, such as the spike protein in COVID, acts as the key to the doorway, all right? And then if it fits, then the cell takes it in and then we have what's called entry. The virus enters the cell and then the outside of the virus is released and then the inside genome of the virus is then allowed to enter and integrate into the cell's cytoplasm, etc. Okay, so it's released into the cell. Now, oftentimes, the fusion aspect of the cell entry process, which is in stage two, um, it can be done in a couple ways. So if it's an enveloped virus, oftentimes the outer envelope just becomes a part of the outer cell membrane and then the capsid inside the envelope virus is just dumped inside. And sometimes the virus, whether it's enveloped or non-enveloped, is just swallowed through a method called endocytosis, which is when the outside membrane of a cell just kind of wraps itself around something and drags it in. And in this case, it comes in through a little vesicle bubble, but then eventually that vesicle bubble is going to break down and eventually just, again, release the virus genome into the cell. Okay, so this is just an example of COVID-19. Its spike protein binds the ACE2 receptor and then releases the RNA genome inside the COVID-19 SARS-CoV-2 virus. Okay, then we enter stage three, which is the replication and gene expression cycle in this, or part of the cycle. In this phase, the virus uses the host cell machinery to make its genome and proteins necessary for new viruses. If it's a viral genome, it's going to be making either DNA or RNA. If it's viral proteins, it's going to be making any proteins necessary for the virus to continue its job, whether it's enzymes, capsid, spike proteins, etc. Sometimes the first thing it's going to make for the viral proteins is a viral RNA polymerase, which is going to help you make the genome that you need for the virus. And then once you have more viral 
genome, you that viral genome can then be used to make more viral proteins, etc. And it just kind of goes on and on and on. Okay. Now, how the viral genome integrates into the cell differs greatly, whether it's a basic straightforward RNA genome or a DNA genome. Okay, so just kind of to recall, if you haven't learned it yet, or if you forgot, the way cells make protein is there's your DNA inside your nucleus of your cell. And then that is converted into kind of a middleman called RNA. And then that RNA can then be used to turn to make proteins that help you do your job. So in the case of a virus, um, in your host cell, your DNA is normally found in your nucleus. And then in the nucleus, you make RNA and then the RNA exits into the cytoplasm where it's then read by the green thing. That green thing is ribosomes that naturally occur in your cytoplasm and that ribosome reads your RNA to make protein. When you are infected with a virus, what happens instead, if it's a basic simple RNA virus, is instead what's happening here is the RNA gets dumped immediately into the cytoplasm and the ribosomes that read your normal RNA and make normal proteins, those same ribosomes will, will basically, you know, be traitors, betray you, and then start reading instead the virus RNA and start making viral proteins and viral things that you don't want it to be making inside your cell. Oh, and then, uh, by the way, to mention the geno the DNA part when it reads it, um, in this case, what it'll do instead of using the RNA is DNA-based viruses, what they want to do is sneak their DNA into the nucleus and then the nucleus machinery that makes the RNA that then gets sent into the um, cytoplasm, it'll start making viral RNA and then send it into the cytoplasm to be read and make more viral proteins. So it just sneaks a little bit earlier into the protein path making pathway if it's a DNA-based virus. Okay, but either way, both of those methodologies are gonna result in lots of viral proteins being made and lots of viral genomes being made. And eventually you're gonna get a pretty big buildup of both of those things inside the cell and they're gonna start spontaneously assembling into proteins. Why do they say proteins? Into viruses. And those viruses, once they are completely made, they can start being released. Sometimes they get released very gently. They just gently exit the cell one or two at a time through a process called exocytosis. And sometimes they get released violently. There's millions of viruses building up inside the cell until the cell explodes and bursts apart. And then those viruses fly and get to be released free and just do whatever they want to do in the tissue and float around to the next uninfected cell to start its new cycle. All right, so different types of viruses infiltrate our cells different ways. So I mentioned RNA viruses can just immediately dump their RNA genome into your cells and start making the viral proteins. But there is a disadvantage to that. And that's because RNA is extremely fragile. So sometimes that RNA doesn't get a hold of your cell immediately and it breaks down before the virus is able to really get its foot in the door and really start taking over that cell. That's why you hear a lot about viral dosages getting, or viral exposure. It takes quite a few COVID-19 viruses because COVID-19 is a typical RNA virus before you have a shot of getting COVID, actually. Um, very short exposures and small doses of viruses don't necessarily mean you're gonna get a COVID infection. But very large doses, doses or lo long exposures to viruses can pretty much greatly increase your risk of getting COVID-19. DNA viruses are more hardy. Not only is DNA itself more stable, but once it sneaks into the nucleus and integrates its DNA into the host cell, it's also going to be able to be more stable and hidden and protected, not broken down as quickly. And you can only really get rid of that virus by destroying the entire host cell versus an RNA virus. If it doesn't get its foot in the door, that RNA breaks down and then the host cell is fine. Okay, so there's two main types of, D of DNA integrating viruses that I want to go over, um, and that is uh, DNA viruses and retroviruses. And one of the classic DNA viruses are bacteriophages. 
So this is a DNA virus that infects bacteria and archaea, and they have two replication pathways, lytic and lysogenic. I like to go over these pathways because they become really critical for understanding how, how these viruses are used in biotech or biotechnology. So in this case, the lytic cycle for these viruses are the, it's, it's very RNA-like, the very simple pathway that I explained earlier, where you just dump your genome into the cell, your genome is read, your proteins are made. This can be done in the cytoplasm here because this is a bacteria which doesn't have a nucleus. It immediately gets read, and then you, you immediately assemble lots of virus copies, and, um, and then they get released. Pretty straightforward. The lysogenic cycle is the sneaky spy phase. So in this phase here, by the way, this is what a bacteriophage typically looks like in most cartoon renderings. It looks kind of like a weird spider. So anyways, in the lysogenic phase here, the phage attaches, but instead of immediately making and assembling virus babies, what it does instead is it integrates its phage DNA into the host cell and the host cell's DNA, and then it looks exactly like any other gene in the host cell. And your cell, the host cell treats it like any other gene, including replicating that gene as part of its DNA when it replicates and makes new babies. So all future cells will then have the virus genome inside of it. And the virus is just sitting there. It's waiting. It hasn't replicated yet. And at any moment, it may switch, a f switch something and flip over to the lytic cycle and then take over and destroy that cell by making tons of its babies. But you don't know when it's going to happen. It can happen at any moment. That's the lysogenic phase. So that's in a bacteria. For humans, that can happen in and animal cells. We can have that happen too. There are certain DNA viruses like adenoviruses that act just like the bacteriophage, but they have like a little special advanced ability of not just doing that, but sneaking into the nucleus to do that inside our nucleus. But I also want to mention a really weird virus called retroviruses. HIV is one of the two main retroviruses that we've that um, infect humans. The other one is um, HTLV. But anyways, so this this virus um, can convert their RNA into DNA. So they do kind of an extra step. So instead of just dumping their RNA into your cytoplasm and having your cytoplasm read it. They dump their RNA into the cytoplasm, immediately convert it to DNA, and then stick the DNA into the host, host DNA, kind of like the bacteriophage, but it does like an extra weird step. Seems a little convoluted, and it is. But by doing this, it hides, just like I said, it's in the sleeper mode. And the really tricky thing about HIV and what made it really insidious, and it's pretty much one of... I would still classify it as incurable. There has been one person that I know of that has been uh, treated and cured of HIV, but and that has only been one person in, in basically 40-ish years um, that is well known. Um, so there's no real known successful actively available cure for HIV. But what happens here is your immune system, the animal immune system, is really good at hunting out diseases, but unfortunately, it can only attack and destroy a cell if it recognizes a cell is doing weird stuff. So if your cell is just quietly including this gene, this virus gene, without making the virus itself, then the, your body won't attack it because it just looks like a normal cell. And it's just going to sit there and hide. And, that any, and, and be included in future generations of that cell. And eventually, one day, that, that hidden genome will suddenly start replicating and making more viruses. So what happens then is a lot of treatments for HIV can attack and kill most of the, vir most of the virus-producing cells, but it's always going to miss those few cells that have the hidden genes the hidden virus gene integrated inside of it when it's in a lysogenic-like phase, okay? Now, as humans, this makes HIV scary, but as humans, we've also looked at these viruses are really scary. Why don't we engineer them to do 
our dark fitting. And instead for humans, oh, by the way, this is that weird thing where I said retroviruses kind of do an extra step by turning their RNA into DNA and then entering it like that. But anyways, going back to what I said, humans have looked at these kind of scary viruses and we looked at it and we went, hey, those are cool. Why don't we engineer them into doing something weird for us on our behalf? And we've actually engineered viruses because, right, the scary part is they integrate the virus genome to like do our dark bidding. And we've instead taken those viruses and only taken the outside part of the virus and removed the virus genome and then stuck genes we want to insert into human cells instead. So maybe you have sickle cell anemia and you want to start making the good proteins for hemoglobin to let you breathe and use oxygen correctly. Cool. Let's stick and package a gene that makes successful proteins that prevent sickle cell anemia into a virus, stick that virus into your body and make that gene now become part of your cells and correctly make the proteins that your cell is missing. And that's what we've done with viruses like adenoviruses. So you're gonna hear about adenoviruses to an extent because some of the, mo some of the successful COVID-19 viruses, the one-shot viruses like the Johnson & Johnson one, actually utilize DNA viruses and have engineered them to uh, train your body to protect itself against COVID-19. And we'll get into that later on. Okay, one last thing I wanted to mention before we close this all up. Viruses, DNA or RNA, they replicate really fast. They're short. They take over your cells and make your cells make thousands of babies. And every time you replicate and make a new virus, you, in you include an extra shot of a mutation happening. So all viruses have a really high rate of mutation. But RNA especially has a much quicker rate of mutation than DNA because the polymerases that your cells, your viruses are using to make its babies are just a little bit wonkier and more mutation prone with RNA. And another thing is um, there are methods where RNA from two different viruses, if you're unlucky and you're infected, if someone is infected with two viruses, two virus strains at once, you can actually integrate and mix and match those two viruses. Now, this doesn't happen for everything. Those viruses have to be very similar with only slight changes to them for these two viruses to mix together. All right, so you're not going to mix a flu virus with a COVID-19 virus or an HIV virus with a COVID-19 virus, but you can take two strains, like the Brazilian strain and the South African strain, and mix them up if they infect the same person. That's why people are still talking that even if the death rate goes down, even with the vaccines, it's still really critical to reduce the amount of spread as much as possible for COVID-19 because we want to prevent a mutation, another mutation from occurring or recombination from happening as much as possible because we want those mutations to stop so that our vaccines are as, success are as successful as possible. And these variants look really scary, but I also want to put some context into it. I've been following a lot of the scientific news and it still looks like our vaccines are really, really robust and quite good at preventing severe symptoms of COVID despite all these mutations. And that's our technology. It's, it's pretty dang good right now. Okay, so anyways, um, summary and takeaways, mainly viruses are non-living pathogens that take over your cells. RNA viruses have different strategies to take over your cells compared to DNA viruses. Um, a more simple RNA virus is just gonna dump its genome and use, its, use your ribosomes right away in a host cell, while a DNA virus needs to find a way to sneak its genome into the DNA of the host, but it also happens to integrate its genes into the host genes. And we as humans have used that, that, that virus uh, tech basically and engineered it to insert desired genes into desired cells for our own bidding. Anyways, on that note, these were the vocabulary words we covered today and that ends the lecture. Bye.